to the cloud. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Dog Q&A. This is number 48. And we have with us again today, Dr. Jesse McClure, who's here to help us understand more about separation anxiety in dogs. And this is week three of four with him. Hi, Jesse. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Excellent. So uh, last week, why don't you do a little recap just of what we've learned so far, broad stroke. Okay, so I think uh, there's actually one un recurring or underlying theme in what we've talked about so far, and that's getting true data, getting an accurate picture of what your dog is actually doing. Uh, it's very easy for us to make assumptions or to be concerned about things, but the best way to go is to get some sort of camera, a webcam, or even an old cell phone. You can put you know free software on to just broadcast what's happening, and you can see what your dog is really doing while you're away from the home. Are they... Uh, 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 anxious the entire time you're away, or do they really just react to you coming and going and they settle in between? Uh, and if they are anxious while you're away, one of the first steps we, we like to do in treatment, which is going to be our theme today, if I remember correctly, uh, one of the first things we want to do is assess how soon after your departure does your dog really get uh, essentially panicked. What, what, is, what behavior can we observe? Uh, and we, so we do two things. We identify what their stress signs are because every dog displays different sets of stress signs. So what is your dog's individual stress signs? And how soon does it really set in after you leave? Are they okay for five minutes or are they okay for 10 minutes? And that will inform the first steps of, of our intervention. Great, yeah, that's perfect. And so you mentioned um, noting or being able to know how long it takes our dogs after we leave to start displaying some stress signals. What part does that factor into treatment? The hardest part. <laughs> so the, what the goal of treatment is, is it's actually not that different from treating a lot of other fears or anxieties. Uh, the general process is called desensitization. And if we think about it in another context, for example, if your dog is afraid of, of strangers, uh, you might introduce them to strangers from a very far distance, far away where they're relatively comfortable, uh, but they know the stranger is there. And as they get comfortable at that distance, you'll move a little closer and a little closer and a little closer. And you'll only go at the dog's pace. So in the training world, we'll often refer to thresholds. There's a threshold at which if you're too close, in the case of a stranger, your dog will be really uncomfortable. And some dogs that might look like they're cowering, other dogs, they might be barking and lunging, but there's some distance at which they have this threshold that if we go beyond that, it's not okay with them anymore. And the key to desensitization is to always stay outside that threshold. Uh, I, one, one book I recently read, uh, she used the term, uh, I think she said, tickling the underbelly of the dog's threshold, uh, because you also don't want to be too far away. Again, using the simple example of a dog who's afraid of people, if they're okay up to about 50 feet away, you're not going to make a whole lot of progress if you're only practicing at 200 feet away. Uh, so you do kind of need to push the boundaries, but you always want to err on the side of being on the dog's safe side of that threshold. Now, people seem to accept that quite well when we're talking about a fear of a person or a fear of, uh, I was just working with a dog with a fear of cardboard boxes. You know, anytime a new cardboard box showed up and nowadays with Amazon deliveries, that's quite a problem. Uh, but people are readily accept that there's a distance at which their dog feels comfortable and they don't wanna push that distance too quickly. Separation anxiety, we want to do the exact same thing, but that's a lot harder for people to accept, both intellectually or conceptually and for practical purposes. So if, going right back to your question, if the dog is comfortable up until about 10 minutes and then they start showing some real stress signs, then our training starts by departures of only eight minutes or something, something less than 10 minutes. Uh, and there's, there, are, there are factors where you want to be throw a little variability in there, but you always want to be well below that 10 minute mark. The, and again, that might make conceptual sense, but when we work with a dog with separation anxiety, those training sessions where we depart for five minutes or seven minutes or eight minutes, always well below that 10 minutes, those training sessions should be the only time that that dog is alone. Okay, so, for, so here's a that? question for you. 
<laughs> so if the dog can only be alone for eight minutes, what do we do when we go to work? Great question. Uh, and actually that's one of, that's the biggest hurdle to doing separation anxiety training well. And first of all, to again, draw the parallel to make sure we're clear about what's happening is when the dog is left alone, again, assuming this is true separation anxiety, the dog is having a panic attack. So comparing it again to a stranger, if your dog had a panic attack, every time they were within five feet of a stranger, you would totally accept that when we're training, we're going to stay outside of five feet. But nobody would think, well, while we're training, we'll stay outside of five feet. But for the rest of the day, my dog's going to be pressed right up against a stranger. You know, that, that wouldn't work because then you're not actually desensitizing, which again, that's the key process. We want to gradually introduce these, these, this isolation for a long time. You're not desensitizing, but you're actually sensitizing. So if you're overexposed, anybody, who's, anybody who has any fears or phobias can probably relate to this. If you're just flooded with the thing you're afraid of, you're not going to get used to it in most cases. You're going to panic worse. And that fear or that phobia is going to get worse. Now, again, in practical terms, that's very difficult for people because we work. Nowadays, a lot of people are working from home, so that can be useful. It's both a blessing and a curse for separation anxiety. We have time to work with our dogs now, uh, but we all should be working with our dogs now to, to make sure we can go back to work. Uh, so to, to go back more directly to your question, what do we do with, with the dog if the owner of a separation anxiety dog has to go to work? I mean, that's just part of life. They've got to be able to go to work to pay for the trainer. They've got to be able to go to work to pay for the dog food. So this, you know, some sacrifices can't be made. Uh, and in those situations, we want to recruit helpers. Uh, you know, another trainer that I'll give her name later that I'm going to refer to a lot. She says, you know, it takes a village to, to uh, rehabilitate or to, to help a dog with separation anxiety. And it takes some creativity. It's not actually that hard. You just have to take some time to sit down and plan who might be able to help out. Do I have family members who could spend some time with a dog? Can I hire a dog walker who will spend some time with a dog? Is my dog equipped to go to daycare? Can we have some days where the dog is at daycare? Uh, so there are many other factors that you can look into, but these are you need to set up the support system or the support structure to help you achieve that primary goal of not leaving the dog alone for longer than they can currently handle. So sending your dog to a place where there's a person won't work against the training, correct? No, because no. that needs to happen at home with you in the short eight minutes leaving and coming back and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. But a management approach could be sending the dog to a place where it's not going to happen. Exactly. Uh, and there, there are actually kind of indirect components of that where the dog, if it's, let's say it's a daycare and daycare is not right for every dog, but it's useful for a lot of dogs. So it's one of, one of the options that should be considered. If your dog is comfortable with daycare, daycare has a lot of benefits of building confidence, just the socialization, that energy release, the, the fun of it. And that confidence building can sometimes translate into helping with the separation anxiety. I'll, I'll give a important caveat with that though. I say it can sometimes help very indirectly. This is one thing that I'm starting to change in my strategy of helping dogs with separation anxiety as I've learned more about the actual data that we're collecting. And by we, I mean, there's a network of trainers uh, called uh, Certified Separation Anxiety Trainers. I am not one of them, but I read a lot of their, their literature, their information. And they all work together and pool data and are now actually publishing some of their data on essentially what works and what doesn't work. And there's a couple of common themes that many of us have used for a long time with dogs with separation anxiety. And these all relate to building confidence. Uh, food puzzles, they're a great way for a dog to build confidence, resilience, and just kind of feel better about themselves. Uh, daycare, just the social interaction to play. These are all healthy and good things for dogs to do. But the data we're now starting to see on actually treating separation anxiety suggests that it's not actually helpful. Now I don't, and it's not harmful, but it's not directly helping the main issue of separation anxiety. And so sometimes it's worth asking, you know, do we want to try to get our, our clients or dog owners to be doing all these other things when they've got a big enough problem with separation anxiety? So 
for example, let me just go with food puzzles. I love food puzzles for dogs. I think every dog owner should look into them. But if your main concern, excuse me, if your main concern is separation anxiety, you've got enough on your plate. You can put the, the confidence building, the food puzzles on the back burner and focus on recruiting that village of people who are going to help you not leave your dog alone for longer than they can handle. And so when people are working, so maybe they've set up their management protocol, they are, they are able to prevent the dog from being alone too long. What is a time frame range that people are looking at when working with a dog that can't be alone for say 10 minutes or longer than 10 minutes? And I, I say range because <laughs> So many factors go into this. <laughs> so what's like a low end? It's gonna take this long to work on this. And what's a what's the longest time frame you've seen? You mean for time frame of how long will the recovery process take? Yes. Uh, I would say it's somewhere between one week and eternity. <laughs> so, uh, and actually one week is highly unrealistic. Uh, it, it varies so widely and it varies by the individual dog. And I, from what I've seen, there's not really a, even a good mapping from the length of duration they're comfortable with and how long it would take to, to really make solid progress. For example, what I'm suggesting is you might think that, well, my dog can, here's dog A can be alone only for five minutes before they panic and dog B can be left alone for about 45 minutes before they panic. Maybe dog B will get better faster. That's not necessarily true. Uh, however, dog B has that head start is now you can start already on 40 minute departures or maybe 35 minutes, you know, you can start at these departures that are of substantial length, where with that dog who can only be alone, I forget the number I said, but for the dog that can only be alone for five minutes, you're going to only be doing three minutes or so. Uh, and some dogs, it's even shorter than that. Sometimes the first sessions are, you're, we're talking seconds, you know, five, 10 seconds. Uh, so you have to go at your dog's pace uh, and separation anxiety as with most other rehabilitation for stress anxiety i, I i'm a broken record in using the the comparison to it, it's a tortoise and hare story take smaller steps and you will get to the goal faster the worst thing you can do is push too far too fast because then you'll fall you'll fall on the wrong side of your dog's threshold they'll have a, a setback will have a potentially a panic attack while you're away. And now you're, now you're, now you're set back. You set back the whole process, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, maybe worse. So really patience is key. Uh, but this is a, kind of another factor in, in the, the treatment. I, we talked earlier about collecting data on what your dog is doing while you're not there. While you're treating, you want to collect data on how long your dog was left alone. And you get recordings of each time and you see how long is it before they show those even those precursor signals that data is essential for us to to create our next day's treatment plan for us to know what next steps to take it's also essential for for you as the owner for us as the dog owner to see okay we are getting better it's a slow process but it's an ongoing process mm -hmm. and so that's a little bit like you know, if anybody who's raised kids or been a kid, uh, marking the their height on a wall as they grow, because when you live with somebody all day or every day, you don't notice that they're getting taller. But clearly, at one point they were tiny, and at another point they're grown adults. By marking those the spots on the wall, you can see that we're making progress. We're getting somewhere. And so, collecting that data with separation anxiety is like marking the wall, and you can see, okay, we are moving forward. Yeah, I often have people write on their calendar <laughs> just moments of things so they can look back and I always say measure your progress in weeks and months and not days and minutes, mm -hmm. you know, like look for the long term, look back, remember what it used to be. <laughs> Don't forget where you started. And dogs are living beings. And so the, the, the overall trajectory of their progress should be kind of an upwards linear progression. But you're not going to see that if you're looking day by day. 
because there will be fluctuations that your dog will have a bad day. You'll have a bad day. We all have bad days. We have days where, you know, whatever, every one of us is our own issues we're dealing with. And on some days they bother us more than others. Uh, and so your dog, as you chart your data, there will be, you know, it'll seem to be going up and then it'll be going down and up and down. But tracking it over time, like you said, on the weeks to month scale, that's when you're going to really see if you're doing it well, you're going to see the progress. And that's also why we need the data. If you're not seeing that progress, we need to revisit and say, what are we not doing right? Or what can we do better? And what are some things that kind of hinder progress? Hmm. Whether, I mean, it could be um, maybe the people don't have a village. Yeah. You know, maybe there's a person who can come periodically. Do you ever see things like that? Oh, yes. So without a doubt, the number one hindrance to progress and separation anxiety is, you could call it the failure in management. And that sounds harsh, uh, but it is anytime the dog is left alone beyond their threshold. That without a doubt is by far the number one hindrance or the number one challenge. Uh, so much so that some some people who focus who really emphasize just on separation anxiety they have a contract with the owner and it's like this is these are the commitments you're making to your dog uh this is, is essentially it's a very hard line of this cannot happen this cannot be allowed uh so i suppose i was being a little too optimistic and considering your question of assuming that doesn't happen what are the biggest hindrances and the challenge in answering that is the margin between that and the next hardest hindrance is huge. So if we can deal with that, there are other things that might there might give us up and ups and downs, but most of them can be worked through. Uh, I'm thinking of some I've worked with where they were making pretty good progress and they were doing everything well and they were really committed to the management plan of never leaving the dog alone. But then some construction happened across the road that they weren't aware of. And so they were leaving their dog alone for whatever the, the appropriate duration for the dog was. And the construction made a bunch of noise and the dog panicked. And so that was, not only was that a bad day, but that bad day set us back. And so we said, okay, tomorrow we're, we're not doing this time period anymore. We're, we're gonna go back to something easier for the dog to catch back up. That's such an important point is to flow with your dog. Don't put a rule in place and make your dog follow it because it's not gonna happen. <laughs> Certainly not when we're working with uh, anxiety. Yes. I would argue not even with basic obedience, but certainly not with anxiety. <laughs> and so what are some things that can maybe aid the process, if anything, besides the management and things like that? Are there other tools that we can incorporate? That will, well, there's one that would be, would be, I would strongly encourage for pretty much any dog with separation anxiety, and that's medication. Uh, and I don't know if we want to talk about that now, if that's going to be a separate element, but that would be the biggest one, is that separation anxiety is one of a handful of conditions where, I, I don't want to say it's a no-brainer, but where if a dog is truly struggling with separation anxiety, the first step is to talk to the vet and one, rule out any medical conditions, but two, is, uh, talk to the vet about inappropriate medication. There are currently two FDA-approved medications for dogs for treatment of dogs with separation anxiety. Uh, and I don't wanna go into what they are. That's a discussion that clients should have with their vet, but there are drugs specifically for separation anxiety that can be a huge benefit. The, the medications, however, are never going to fix the problem. They are an adjunct or they're to support the, the, the desensitization or the training that we're talking about. So that's the biggest thing. Uh, I'm, I will admit I'm still a little inclined to think that a lot of the the food puzzles and the confidence building activities would be beneficial but as the scientist in me says you know what we've, we've collected the data and there's not much benefit uh i, I really do acknowledge what, what the i really do accept the argument that while those things may or may not have a benefit they certainly have a cost because everything we we ask the, the, the dog owner to do when we're doing this process is a burden to them and even the fun stuff, it takes time out of their day. So that's a place where perhaps it's not worth that investment. So the biggest thing that will aid is probably medication. Uh, other things that may aid a dog are gonna vary widely by case by case. Uh, and the crating is probably a good example of this. 
in most cases, creating a dog for separation anxiety is not going to be very helpful. In many cases, it's going to be harmful. But there are occasional dogs that are genuinely a lot more comfortable in their crate. And that being created during the separations will help those dogs. So it's a little bit of a observation and fine tuning to make sure you're working with the dog that's that's in front of you rather than the, the stereotypical or average dog that we get from our, our collective data. So most dogs do this. Well, yes, we're not working with most dogs on any given day. We're working with one dog. Yeah, that's a great point. I Have you ever seen, I feel like I've seen this a few times um, where there's a dog who's got some separation issues when the owner leaves, they don't like the crate, maybe because of negative association of some kind, but they will find a crate-like area to hide. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I, I do not know. I have a lot of thoughts about that. I don't have anything based on reliable data. My Part of my mind is thinking, if that's where the dog is comfortable, wonderful. We want the dog to find, and that's kind of the goal, is the dog to find ways to self-soothe and make themselves comfortable while they're alone. But another part of me, the, my, the devil's advocate part, is asking, what if that's where the dog is going to basically shut down? And be panicked. They're they're you know cowering in the corner. Uh, again, there's a big difference between you know superficially there's some what might look similar, but there's a big difference between finding a comfortable spot to lay down and cowering in the corner in kind of a subdued panic. Uh, so we'd want to make sure which one it is. Uh, and in in many cases, a good audio recording, so a microphone near that spot, might give some indication of that if there's whining or vocalization. Uh, people have also talked a lot about you know, leaving our clothes around something that smells like us. I don't mind that. I'm not sure there's a whole lot of value because quite honestly, our entire house smells like us to a dog. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, you're, we're not fooling them. Uh, and even if we could fool them, I don't think being dishonest to our dogs is the way to make progress. Uh, so they know that we are gone. Uh, and the, the treatment protocol should focus on helping our dogs successfully deal with us being gone. Uh, there's nothing we're going to do that's going to trick them into kind of thinking we're still there. Uh, very much the same for, any, for a lot of this new technology that's coming out where you can, you know, you can have the webcam type thing and you can talk through it to them. You're not going to fool your dog. They're not going to think you're there, but it will stimulate them to a point or will, will activate them to a point that it might even be a setback is that if they're kind of settling in, but a little nervous, and now they hear your voice, but you're not there, mm -hmm. that might not be helpful. Yeah, it's like when a dog is uncomfortable with their person leaving, and the person does pop-in visits to try to help, that can actually make it worse, because now you're leaving four times. You know, yeah. we don't think of it like the dog does. <laughs> that, that I, I think that's an interesting point, and uh, I believe it depends how you do those, what, what you call pop-in visits, uh, because part of the, the protocol that usually works best is repeated departures in the early stages. When you're doing a, a 30 second departure, you'll leave, or if, let's say 30 seconds is the dog's threshold where they start to panic. You might do a 20 second departure and come back and spend some time with the dog. And then you'll do another 20, well, you won't do 20 seconds. You vary it a little bit, but you do a 20 second departure, come back for a little while. You do a 15 second departure, come back for a little while. Do a 23 second departure, come back for a little while. So you would be coming and going. Uh, but the goal there is as long as you are well below the dog's threshold, you are returning while the dog is still calm. So the pop in visits, I think the biggest, the, the challenge that you would see there is if you're already pushing the dog past threshold. So if the dog can handle 30 seconds and you leave for five minutes and pop in, uh, or you know, probably more realistically what's happening is people are leaving for the work day and popping in for lunch and leaving again, your dog's already over threshold. The damage is, is done and uh, popping in is just gonna make them go through that cycle twice in the day rather than once. Yeah, and then wouldn't you say, I mean, this is true of most issues, prevention is key. <laughs> so what, what would be some prevention of 
separation anxiety? How would you go about making sure this doesn't happen in our dogs, if possible? I will admit that's the most challenging part and the part that the, the certified separation anxiety trainers are really good at, and I cannot claim to, have to be that skilled on. But conceptually, it's ridiculously simple. In practice, it seems very difficult. Uh, the, uh, just simply do not leave the dog alone, period. I mean, again, that's, that sounds difficult, but if you, once you, once you make that commitment, you'll start to see it's not that difficult. The problem is just the, the, the real hurdle, the first hurdle is making that commitment. So our first reaction, my first reaction, if that were, if that were a rule for me and my dog is I cannot have my dog left alone. I'd say that's impossible. And there would be a fair bit of time where I'd be my heels dug in and say, that's not possible, that can't work, I can't do that. Once you get past that, it's impossible to thinking, okay, we're gonna have to do it, how can we do it? I think it actually becomes easier. And so in a way, this is, I see that part of it very much paralleling working with any kind of behavior condition in dogs, uh, aggression, anxiety of any sort, the biggest hurdle, and this is actually the introductory blurb on my website, is the biggest hurdle that dog owners face. Uh, actually, I'm not giving you a quote my own website properly, but the biggest hurdle that dog owners face or the biggest challenge that we face is not aggression, is not destructive behavior, is not anxiety. It's the hopelessness of feeling that nothing can be done. And so it's, it's and that's not true. Behavior can change, things can be done. And so it's the same for the owner's perspective at that point in making that commitment to never leave the dog alone, uh, except for the controlled training settings. It, it seems impossible, but once you start considering all the options, again, options are family members, a neighbor, a neighborhood kid, you know, how many uh, high school kids or grade school kids are there in the neighborhood who for a couple of bucks would be happy to spend some time with your dog. Bring your dog to some other workplace. There are dog-friendly workplaces that would love to have depending on your dog, but if your dog is well-mannered mannered otherwise and socialized with people. You're, I've, I've worked with uh, one, when I worked in Montana, there was an accounting office and they came to us, our, our dog program, and they didn't know much of anything about dogs. We said, you know, we allow dogs in our office, but none of us have dogs. Can any of your dogs just come hang out in our office every once in a while? And so they want that. They want a dog visitor in their workplace. So it's a matter of connecting those resources. You have people out there who have dog-friendly offices who want dog visitors. And now you have a dog owner who has a dog that can't be left alone. We just need to put one and one together there. So that's a big part of the, the initial setup for separation anxiety training is identifying those resources. So dog-friendly workplaces, family members, uh, neighborhood children, uh, dog walkers, dog daycares, anything like that. And so you make a list of all those options and start talking to whoever's around, see who you can line up to do what with your dog. Yeah, and one, I think another hurdle people have is money. What do you say to that? So, for example, <laughs> I come to you, I say, my dog cannot be left alone. He destroys the room. He mm -hmm. eats the walls. Yeah. Um, he broke out of his crate and destroyed it completely and injured himself. Mm -hmm. But I can't afford training. Can you afford to repair your walls and pay the vet bills to treat your dog's injuries? Uh, and the, the, if you do, if you commit, and here's the well, you have to come back to this. If you commit to the process of treating your dog's separation anxiety, you will not be paying for damaged walls anymore. Uh, not never, <laughs> because again, if you commit to it, you are never leaving your dog alone beyond the time that they can handle. So it's not, and so in a way, that's kind of refreshing. That helps might help people get over that initial hurdle. Is they don't want to pay for damage the dog does to the home and pay for the separation anxiety training. You'll only do that if you're paying for bad separation anxiety training or if you're not committing to that separation anxiety training. So if you pay for a, a, a good separation anxiety trainer and you really commit to that process, that's what you'll pay. There'll be no more damage to your home. It's, I don't wanna say impossible because there are setbacks, 
but you design it to be almost impossible. You design it so that your dog will never have another panic attack. Your dog will never damage the furniture again due to separation anxiety stress. Your dog will never injure themselves again due to separation anxiety stress. And now if, you, if somebody truly cannot afford anything, and if they can't afford to repair their damaged walls and they can't afford their vet bills, then there is the difficult discussion of whether there is another home that would be better for that dog. But honestly, that doesn't even have a whole lot to do with separation anxiety. That's if somebody says, I have a dog, I can't even afford basic veterinary care. Mm -hmm. Then you really should be considering, as difficult as a discussion as that is, you should be considering a home that can provide the care that that dog needs. Yeah, that's a great point. And so how would someone, what's a good resource for finding a qualified trainer to deal with an issue like this? My recommendation would be, uh, uh, I'll well, even show her book. Well, I can never say her, I always screw up her last name. Melina DiMartini De, De, De Price. Uh, she's got a great book. You can get this on Amazon. She runs a network of trainers uh, called the Certified Separation Anxiety Trainers. And they do uh, something that I'm only learning to do. They focus on remote sessions, which so you do quite well. Uh, and it's quite intuitive when you think about it for separation anxiety. There's nothing that we as the trainer need to be there to demonstrate. And in fact, us being there can really screw up the process. Uh, so they do, I believe, exclusively remote work. Uh, and they can also, that, that also touches on the previous question, that helps manage the costs, is you're not paying anybody's travel fee, you're not paying for their travel time, uh, they can keep sessions very short. Uh, and the, I believe what the, the CSATs, the Certified Separation Anxiety Trainers do, is that they they have they have remote sessions via something like Zoom, but then they have daily homework or daily activities that they're assigned and, and managed, often via something like a, a Google Docs or a Google spreadsheet, where they put in the, the the missions for the day and the client completes the missions and fills out the data. So there's this there, there's not any actually direct a one on one. There's one on one time via remote Zoom, but there's no trainer coming out there. So a lot of the costs are cut down. Uh, and so anyways, I kind of got off on a tangent. That would be my top recommendation. They have a website for the, the CSATs. Uh, and I don't know if there are any in our St. Louis area, but again, because it's all remote, that doesn't really matter. Uh, you can find somebody in Montana who will work with you via Zoom. You can find somebody in New England who will work with you via Zoom to work through these problems. I would be happy to talk to clients about it, but quite honestly, the, the CSATs are, are far more equipped to do that than I am. If you'd like somebody local to, to come and sit with you and chat about what the process is and to support you with it, that's where I think I can do a lot. Yeah, and that's a great resource. Um that group because they can help with any hindrances with money and with time mm -hmm. because now sessions can be shorter and there's no interference with a trainer in the room because yeah. it does affect the situation you know oh yes it does for all behaviors uh and for for every behavior i think there's a weighing of the pros and cons of the trainer being present uh and i i think there are a lot of benefits in most cases for being right there to really demonstrate and to see the whole environment, uh, but there are cons as well. In separation anxiety, there really aren't any benefits. So it just it becomes much more obvious that the, that the remote work is the, the ideal way to do that. Wow, and we're I feel like this is so timely now because we're in a place of people are still locked down in many places and they're with their dogs preparing to go back to work as things are opening up. And this is the perfect time to start practicing leaving your dog when you don't have to actually leave mm -hmm. and you won't have to be alone long, longer than he can handle. <laughs> and then you can feel good about going back to work and leaving your confident dog at home, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> And when you do, there's actually another thing you can do in, in preparation. So certainly that, you, the, the, the preparation or prevention is essentially a, is the same as the treatment. Uh, you might just start longer because you're, 
<laughs> if your your dog is not, oh, let me say it this way. If you're thinking about prevention, your dog isn't panicking when you leave for 15 minutes. If your dog is panicking for when you leave for 15 minutes, you're not in the prevention stage anymore. You, you need to focus on treatment. But if you're thinking prevention, you take the same approach as treatment, but your dog's already reasonably comfortable and you just want to build that up. So you can go through those departures, but also building or setting the environment up so that it will be similar when you're away as when you are home for the, from the dog's perspective. Uh, so this also touches on, a, a, I don't know if a myth is the right word, but an idea that floats around out there for helping dogs with separation anxiety. People will say things like, well, leave the TV on or leave music on while you're away. And that only makes sense if the TV is on while you're home or while if there's music on while you're home. So the idea, the goal is not to make the environment enriched or, or somehow special while you're away, but to make the environment similar to when you're home. So if you are one of those people, like my stepfather who has five TVs on all the time, whether he's watching them or not, if he's working on prevention for separation anxiety with his dog, I'd say leave those TVs on when you go out. Uh, because otherwise you are creating these cues that when mom and dad are home, TVs are on, all the TVs shut off while they're away. No, keep it as consistent as possible. That's a great point. You don't want to create a, another trigger that you're leaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so I think next time let's get into more of with separation anxiety and the pandemic and what kind of things can we expect when now going back to work and maybe that'll help with some motivation to prevent these things. <laughs> Sounds okay, good. Jesse. Yay, and anything else about um, treatment that you can think of? I think this has all been extremely insightful. I think we covered, I think we covered it as well as we can do in a, in a uh, brief session. Right, right. Okay, well, thank you so much again, Jesse. And thank you for having um, me. You're welcome so much. And then we'll be back next time for our fourth and final episode <laughs> of our separation anxiety with Dr. Jesse McClure. Thank you, Jesse. Bye.